Eva's father, Richard E. Carroll, was born November 3, 1844, to Cynthia Hayes and Nelson Carroll. They lived on a farm near Point Pleasant, Missouri. In 1860, when Richard was around 17, Mary Malsby owned the 77-acre farm along with 46 enslaved people. There were 22 males ranging in age from 75 to under 1 and 24 females ranging in age from 54 to under 1. The farm was located along the Mississippi River about 10 miles south of New Madrid. Corn, wheat, and cotton could have been grown there. In 1862, Confederate troops already occupied this area. In March of 1862, Union General John Pope led a six-week attack on New Madrid and Island No. 10. This ended in Union victory and greater control of the Mississippi River. In the winter of 1862, around the age of 19, Richard fled the farm and joined the Union Army in Point Pleasant, where he worked as a cook. Eventually, he was taken to Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, where the Battle of Shiloh occurred in April of 1862. Then he went to Cairo, Illinois. There he became a body servant for the Provost Marshal who was in charge of military police. The Provost Marshal was transferred to Kewanee, Illinois, and Richard Carroll went with him. On December 18, 1863, Richard became a private in Company D of the 29th Regiment United States Colored Infantry in Kiwani. The enlistment was for three years. On July 30, 1864, in Petersburg, Virginia, Richard Carroll may have fought in the Battle of the Crater. Many of the 1,881 soldiers injured were from the United States Colored Infantry. Richard had an epileptic attack, which he attributed to the excitement of battle and drinking water that was contaminated with blood. However, the Army diagnosed it as a pre-existing condition of epilepsy and issued him a disability discharge on October 22, 1864. Five years after the Civil War in 1870, Richard Carroll was living in Elmira Township in Stark County, Illinois. He had married Mary E. Frey on October 22, 1872, in Stark County. She was from Kentucky and eight years younger than him. Richard worked as a farmer and Mary as a housewife. They had two daughters named Eva and Cynthia, who were two and one. Eva was born August 4, 1869. In 1876, Richard was a miner living in Kiwani on Cutters Avenue just south of South Street. By this time he had three more daughters. The children most likely attended Irving Elementary School which was built in 1867. In 1880, Richard is still living in Kiwani with an even larger family. There are now eight children, seven daughters and one son. The children are 12, 11, 10, 7, 5, 3, 1, and under one year. To support his family, Richard started a laundry business in 1880. Samples of his work were placed in a case in front of Staples Shoe Store in downtown Kiwani. That same year, he was also a porter at the Kiwani House Hotel. Richard Carroll was active in African-American causes. He read the weekly Louisiana newspaper founded by Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback in 1870. Pinchback was an officer in the Civil War and the first African-American governor in the United States for Louisiana. The paper motto was, Republican at all times and under all circumstances and it was one of the few newspapers in the 1800s that appealed to a racially diverse audience. They reported on African-American universities such as Strait and Howard, supported desegregation in education, and encouraged African-American involvement in politics. Richard traveled to Princeton, Illinois to attend a meeting in remembrance of the Emancipation Proclamation. 
and also wrote letters to the editor and gave church lectures about the African-American need to work and vote. On June 4, 1880, Eva's mother, Mary Carroll, died after a long struggle with scarlet fever, complicated by giving birth. She was 31 years old. She left behind a husband of eight years and eight children. Many people attended her funeral at the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was buried in an unmarked grave in a potter's field at Pleasant View Cemetery in Kewanee, Illinois. On December 27, 1882, two and a half years after his wife's death, Richard married Charity Kitchen at the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Macomb, Illinois. She was born in Missouri in 1851 and was 10 years younger than Richard. In 1884, Richard was the first African American man to run as a Republican for political office in Macomb, Illinois. He ran for city sexton and received four votes. Despite his defeat, he stated, the will of the convention is my political law. On April 27, 1888, around the age of 44, Richard applied for a military pension with an invalid classification. He eventually moved to Springfield, Illinois, where he was actively engaged with his family and community. His second wife died and three more wives deserted him, each time ending in divorce. Richard was 73 when he died, December 8, 1917 during an unusually hard winter at the Quincy Veterans Home in Quincy, Illinois. Cause of death was irritation of the bladder. He was buried in a potter's field with a marred grave at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois. Four years after her mother's death and two and a half years after her father remarried, Eva married Emmett Trice on April 19, 1884. Eva was 17 and Emmett was 21. Emmett was the child of Eliza Glenn and Gibraltar Trice of Macon County, Missouri. He worked as a common laborer when they married in Macomb, Illinois. Eventually they had one child. Nine years later, on July 11, 1893, in Macon County, Missouri, Emmett Trice divorced Eva for adultery. One year and four months after the divorce, Emmett died from stomach congestion on November 9, 1894. He had been remarried for only two weeks. One year after her divorce, Eva married Andrew C. Monroe on August 16, 1894. He was biracial and born in Canton, Missouri in 1861 to parents who were both born in Missouri. His family moved to Iowa sometime before 1870. They married in Fort Madison, Iowa when Eva was 27 and Andrew was 32. It was Andrew's first marriage and he was working as a cook. Eva had a daughter named Beatrice who was now 10 years old. The next two years in 1895 and 1896, they lived at 114 Spruce in Fort Madison. Andrew was working as a laborer. Eva later appears as a widow of Andrew in the 1910 census. In 1900, when Eva's daughter was 15 years old, she was charged with larceny for stealing $19 from Eva's father and sister. According to the newspapers, she was involved with immoral resorts involving opium and cocaine and was eventually sent to the Home for Juvenile Female Offenders at Geneva, Illinois. The home was a state institution created in 1894 and located along Route 25 and the Northwestern Railroad. Lincoln Cottage was segregated for African American girls. According to the home's biennial report in 1900, of the 128 girls admitted in the preceding two years, 14% were African American, over 50% came from two-parent households, and almost 50% had gonorrhea, syphilis, or both. Sangamon County sent the third highest number of inmates in Illinois. 
girls were taught high standards of womanhood, including marriage, motherhood, domestic arts, and belief in God. They learned sewing, knitting, cleanliness, nutrition, exercise, and good sleep habits. Ophelia Amig was superintendent while Beatrice was an inmate. Later, in 1911, Ophelia was forced to resign amid allegations of torturing the girls. She used rawhide whips and her own invention, a strong chair, to restrict limb movement. After three years in 1903, when Beatrice was 18 years old, she was licensed to marry Paul Kirby, who was five years older than her. By this time, she was back in Springfield, Illinois, living with her mother. Her fiancé was living at 404 West Williams, on the west side of town near Washington Park. In 1901, the park was designed by Ocean Simons in a naturalistic style. Its 150 acres served as termini for Springfield's urban trolley system. Beatrice and Paul eventually moved to Milwaukee, where Eva's sister, Hesse, lived. After 18 years of marriage, Paul deserted Beatrice and they divorced in 1921. Three years after her divorce, in April of 1924 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Beatrice was licensed to marry Henry Cappell in front of the Justice of the Peace. He was 42, a native of New York, and a stationary fireman. Beatrice was a domestic. It was the first marriage license in Milwaukee between a white man and an African-American woman. Licenses for African-American men marrying white women were common. Three days after obtaining the license and one day before the marriage, on a Friday night, the Ku Klux Klan soaked two wooden crosses in oil and sent three men in a car to put one cross at Henry's house and one cross at Beatrice's home. At 9.30, they lit them simultaneously. Police responded and found charred remains of the crosses, which they took back to the station. While the crosses were burning, the Ku Klux Klan held a meeting at a downtown hall. Reverend Frank E. Dunkley, pastor of the Asbury Methodist Episcopal Church, led the meeting. He was also vice president of the Wisconsin Humane Society. There were approximately 800 attendees with 90 new member applications. William Wiseman, an insurance broker as well as membership recruiter and leader of the Milwaukee Ku Klux Klan, asked a national representative of the group to be there. In the United States, veterans of the Confederate Army created the Ku Klux Klan in 1866 to violently resist Reconstruction after the Civil War. They targeted Catholics, Jews, African Americans, immigrants, free thinkers, and radicals. Membership in the millions peaked in the 1920s with 15,000 in Wisconsin. Milwaukee had the highest number of members in the state. By 1942, Beatrice was married to John Edward Payne, an African American originally from Gladys, Virginia. He was one year older than her and worked as a laborer. She was working at Milwaukee Waste Paper Company and was 57 years old. At the age of 29, Eva's mother and both of her husbands had died, and she was a single parent of a troubled daughter. She grew up in Illinois, but most likely lived in Missouri and Iowa during her marriages. Eva eventually returned to Illinois. In 1867, Springfield's residential area was spreading east of downtown across the 10th Street Railroad tracks. The 400 block of South 12th Street already had development. In 1898, Eva decided to buy a house at 427 South 12th Street and spent the next 45 years there. Her Central East neighborhood was residential but had small businesses such as grocery stores, meat markets, and saloons. There were also some mining and manufacturing industries, public schools, and churches. Residents were low to middle class and ethnically diverse with a significant amount of African Americans. There were no streetcar lines on this side of town yet, and the streets were unpaved, but did have curbs. Homes were wood frame and well kept. 
Lincoln School Church of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Bombs Marble and Stoneworks were located within three blocks of Eva's home. The first orphanage in the United States was established in 1729 in Natchez, Mississippi. It was for white children orphaned by a conflict with Native Americans. In the 1800s, orphanages were established to help alleviate the country's socioeconomic concerns rather than to improve the lives of children. Many of the orphans had parents who could not afford to take care of them. Once in orphanages, some of these children were placed as indentured servants, sometimes against the will of their parents. Wealthy people donated money to establish many of these orphanages. Some of these patrons made harmful decisions, thinking the disenfranchised were not capable of taking care of their own families. Reconstruction ended in 1877. Nineteen years later, in 1896, with Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court upheld racial segregation laws. These laws applied even to orphanages. Eva saw a need, and on March 7, 1898, the Secretary of State incorporated the Lincoln Colored Old Folks and Orphans Home as a charitable organization operating from Eva's new home. It was the first of its kind in Illinois. Incorporators were Eva Monroe, Fanny King, and Ollie Perry. On October 16, 1901, Sangamon County appointed Eva the first African-American probation officer of the juvenile court in Springfield. As a probation officer, Eva filed petitions against children who committed crimes such as larceny or homelessness. Some of these children were current or former inmates of her home. These petitions resulted in hearings, arrests, or placements in state reformatories. Three years later, the home was in financial trouble. Despite paying an initial $400 on the mortgage and raising money from the African American community, they could not pay the remaining $1,000 for mortgage and taxes. By 1904, Mary Lawrence, a wealthy woman and wife of a former Springfield mayor, took over the debt, tore down the old house, and built a new house in the same location. She asked the African-American community to support the home and worked with Herman Pyrick, a local banker, on plans for the building. He was born two blocks from Abraham Lincoln's home and reportedly sat on Lincoln's knee. Herman Pyrick was also treasurer of the Springfield Paving Brick Company, located on the east side of Springfield. Hemley and Hemley Architects were building Lawrence School in Springfield at the same time. It contained the Lawrence Memorial Library, commissioned by Susan Lawrence, and designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Mary used extra brick from this school for the Lincoln Colored Home. Later, Mary Lawrence donated furniture from her own home that was being redesigned by Frank Lloyd Wright. She also obtained water service from the city for the Lincoln Colored Home. The new Frank Lloyd Wright home, located on the 300 block of East Lawrence Avenue, was completed in 1904. On Sunday, October 2, 1904, the Odd Fellows Lodge and other contributors laid the cornerstone for the Lincoln Colored Home. The front entrance featured brick in a stretcher bond pattern, deep raked mortar joints, sandstone red mortar, an arched window of stained glass, a segmental brick arch, intricately carved double doors, a recessed stoop of red tiles, and an electric light. The outside featured a chimney, a low-hipped wood and slate roof, a flat freeze board below the roof line, stone window sills, concrete risers, concrete window wells, a porch with a brick base and wood floor, and a basement stairway on the north side. Inside features include segmental arched windows, a pine staircase, picture rails, chair rails, electric lights, and transom windows above doors. The first floor has a front entrance that opens into a foyer. The foyer leads into a corridor that opens into three parlors, a porch, a sewing room, a bedroom, and a bathroom. 
A staircase to the second floor is also located in the foyer. A laundry and office were also located in the home. Ceilings on the first floor are 10 feet high. The staircase leads up to four bedrooms and two bathrooms. Ceilings on the second floor are 9 feet high. There is also a basement containing a large room, three smaller rooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, a hallway, a furnace room, and a coal room. On January 25, 1905, Mary Lawrence, her daughter Susan Lawrence, and Eva created Articles of Incorporation and named themselves as the initial board of directors for the home. They established the name as Lincoln Colored Home, inmates as colored old people and orphans, management as a board of three directors elected annually, and location as 427 South 12th Street. Two months later, Mary Lawrence died, but was remembered with literature and music annually at the home. One of the musicians, Maisie Mallory, gave a harp solo in 1909. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, Maisie traveled with minstrel, comedy, vaudeville, novelty, and burlesque shows in the United States and abroad. She performed with her husband, Ed Mallory, and his brother, Frank Mallory, and his wife, Grace Halliday. They called themselves the Mallory Brothers. Maisie and her group were regularly reviewed in newspapers. They played at the Bijou and Star Theaters in Brooklyn, New York, and the Court Street Theater in Buffalo, New York. Reviewers praised original song and dance numbers such as the Blackville Derby and Maisie's Indiana Home State Song on the Banks of the Wabash, instrumentals with bells, mandolins, and cornets as well as opera solos were common. In the beginning, Eva traveled around Illinois and Iowa to find inmates, although over time this was no longer necessary. She traveled to Peoria, Jacksonville, Quincy, Rock Island, Joliet, Decatur, Edwardsville, Galesburg, Beardstown, Alton, Monmouth, and Havana, Illinois, as well as Fort Madison and Davenport, Iowa. These towns were easily accessible via the extensive railroad network at the turn of the century. On July 6, 1906, the State of Illinois Public Charity Service inspected Eva's home in response to a request for a certificate. They found four elderly people. Three of them paid $25 for their care and one worked for the house. There were 32 children, 14 boys and 18 girls, ranging in age from one to 16. The court committed all of the children and paid the home $600 a year. The children attended St. John's Methodist and Baptist churches and Lincoln School. Eva placed 89 children during 1906 and visited them regularly. The inspector stated the home was in good condition, neat, clean, and sanitary. He noted there were wood floors, a furnace, and electric lights. He recommended the certificate be granted. In 1909, President Theodore Roosevelt held the first White House Conference on Children. The result was a trend to place children with foster families, rather than in institutions. Many states passed legislation to pay pensions to mothers, but mothers who were immoral or who had bad characters were exempt. This meant that the number of children in institutions did not decrease until around 1944. Susan Lawrence Dana served as treasurer of the Lincoln Colored Home in 1909. From September to October, she reported almost $170 in receipts and $97 in payments. Half of the receipts came from Sangamon County. Almost all the payments went to individuals, with the remainder going to power and phone companies. In 1910, Eva was 42 years old and living at the home with an assistant matron and 14 inmates. They included five widows, ranging in age from 70 to 93, and nine children, ranging in age from 8 to 19. 
All residents were female except for two male children. Places of birth included Illinois, Virginia, Alabama, and North Carolina. Everyone's native language was English. In 1912, Eva wrote a letter to Susan Lawrence congratulating her on her new marriage and offering Christian blessings. She also jokes about being the next one to marry. May 26, 1912 My dear Mrs. Susan Lawrence Jorgendahl, Oh, you great big beautiful doll! Your announcement came as I was not much surprised. Glad to welcome a new member to our home board. Came home last week, sister some better, all my charge are well, and pray for your safe return again. It's like dear Grandma often said, I had a presentment of your change now that you are happy. May you and husband be spared to enjoy the Christ blessing from heaven. And may the same true friendship ever be cemented with love until we cross the bar of justice, there free from the cares of this busy life. And may our life's work shine as brilliant as yours, loved and cherished by all whom your kind and loving hands have aided. Like our sainted mother you are to us. Now be happy twice in God's name. I bid you a long happy life full of sunshine. Yours, Eva. P.S. Guess who's next? In 1913, the Curran Commission investigated Illinois Children's Home and AIDS Society in Chicago. The orphanage was accused of sending older African-American orphans to Milwaukee and the South, where they would be used as slaves without informing their parents. That same year, the same committee supposedly investigated the Lincoln Colored Home, then made a scandalous report. They reported that wealthy white men and women from the South sent their biracial children to the home. It was later refuted in the papers. Also in that year, Governor Edward Dunn of Illinois visited the Lincoln Colored Home to celebrate 50 years of emancipation. He remarked that African Americans appreciated their liberation, had human souls, were educated, practiced religion, and had accumulated wealth. Drawings, paintings, and domestic science works were displayed in the home to show the race's progress. Lawrence Jorgendahl, second husband of Susan Lawrence, performed a solo for the event. During the same time, Eva refuted claims that white women gave birth at the home. She stated, Such is not the case. It is true that we will receive colored children born of white mothers and white children born of Negro women, but this is when they are sent to the home at the approval of the courts and when they are not admitted to other orphans' homes. We have one instance where a colored child born of a white woman was placed in the institution. The relationship between Eva and Susan Lawrence eventually became strained. In a letter Susan wrote to her cousin Flora, she complains about Eva making too many demands, secretly traveling, not living within her means, expecting to be provided for, and not being responsible for taking care of her own race. My dear Flora, my brain has not been clear enough to think and consider about the colored home until now. I am sending you a letter that came from Mrs. Monroe a few days ago. From the tone of it, one would think I induced her to open and take up that homework. She seems to intimate that I should ensure her a permanent provision for her maintenance. Now as far as I am concerned, she can stop that work any time she sees fit to do so. I cannot see my way clear to do any such thing. The charity work was her own choice. She has remained in it for the good of her own people. She has not conferred a thing on me by doing it. I have not received any benefit from it and have had no end of worry about the work and her personally. Her demands on me have been entirely too heavy. Her conducting of things at times has not met my approval. I have heard many just criticisms and many unjust ones. I have used great patience and consideration weighed them all. Last summer I did not like a shady thing she did about going to that Ohio convention while I was ill. I found it out from Joe, but said nothing even to him. 
was about at a place where I was liable to explode. This December, when she came to me and told me she was going to marry that preacher, Manuel, whose wife had so recently died, I would have helped her get ready for that, feeling it would be a solution to the problem and dispose of her and her future. After that, the board could hire a matron whom they could deal with as a matron. They would have to pay her a salary. This is what they should have done all along and what I am going to insist they do. I will pay $5 a month toward it until the financial condition of the home warrants the board assuming the responsibility of it all. As it now is, she as anyone gives us credit for what we do. Then she will have to live within the salary or strike for higher pay and leave the home. My thought was if we could only forcibly dispose of her by marriage, it would be best than if a new matron did not make good, and for any reason the home should not be kept up, we could close it for lack of funds to continue the running expenses. No one seems willing to contribute towards its support and never will, as long as they think I am standing back of it. This was one reason why I was willing to buy the house. If put under the Industrial Act, no one could be insured more pay for the children, and of course we would have to comply with the law governing those things. The new board thought we could do this under someone's guidance. Mrs. Monroe asked me not to say anything about her going to be married. She told me a short time ago that it was off, that the preacher was going to marry a woman from the South. I was never more sorry than to hear that. After reading her letter, you will see what I mean by saying I am not responsible for her being there and doing what she has, and she as no one should think I am. I want to do now and always will everything I can for her and the home, but I am not going to assume the responsibility of caring for the unfortunates of the race when their own people do not feel any responsibility. A free horse gets ridden to death. That bathroom incident and the Mary Lizzie Brooks and Monroe engineered it, trying to cover it, and it was an insult to any sane person's intelligence, and I told her so before Mrs. Rose. I am tired of these things. I have always felt a certain hesitancy and consideration toward her and have allowed her license because of her own initiation and part in starting this work. This was due her, but to have her laid down on me as though it was my work and I was responsible for her doing it and should bind myself to provide for her is more than I am going to stand for. I deplore more than anyone that she has had no salary. Could I get some extra money ahead so I could share it? I would give her a thousand dollars and have her sign a paper of acknowledgement to the board of receipt of this money for past services up to date. Then she could get out or stay on the salary they could provide. I have signed the paper for the new charter for both the girls and boys, and am sending it to Joe with this in the letters addressed to Joe. I want them to have it before next Tuesday's meeting of Mary. Please read this letter to Joe Bunn alone. I am getting the new bylaws ready. We'll mail them all together, and Joe can give them to her. In 1920, there were 19 inmates, including six males. There were two widows, ages 67 and 82. Children ranged in age from 4 to 15. Places of birth were Illinois, Kentucky, Virginia, and many unknown. Almost everyone could read and write. In 1907, Margaret Olivia Sage established the Russell Sage Foundation to improve social and living conditions in the United States. She was the widow of railroad magnate Russell Sage. Major early projects involved low-income housing, urban planning, labor reform, and social work. In 1920, the Foundation published a survey of social conditions in Springfield. They concluded that care for orphans addressed material needs rather than nurturing needs. The Lincoln Colored Home specifically was overcrowded, outdated, and underpaid. In 1930, there was a cook and a secretary, Maisie Mallory, plus 36 inmates with 14 males. All inmates were children ranging in age from 3 to 15. 
There were eight sets of siblings. The inmates were from Illinois, Missouri, Ohio, and Arkansas. Eva was now 61 years old. Children and staff were served breakfast, dinner, and supper every day. Almost all meals included bread, butter, and milk. There was a mix of cereal, peanut butter, beans, all kinds of meat, pasta, fruit, vegetables, and dessert. Staff often ate the same meals as children, and leftovers were common. In the 1930s, Ruth Jackson from the State of Illinois Welfare Department conducted a six-month study of the home as part of a statewide effort to more effectively serve African-American orphans. The inspector covered writing, food, money matters, clothing, punishment, visiting, partiality, and laxity of supervision. Eva received scathing evaluations in each category, showing an overall pattern of neglect, exploitation, and abuse. According to the report, Eva did not allow children to communicate with friends and family. She didn't provide quality food or enough of it. She stole money from work wages, insurance policies, and bank accounts. Clothing was distributed to favorites, and the others got ugly, ill-fitting, and patched things to wear. Punishment consisted of keeping children out of school, making them work without pay, and physical abuse with whips, ropes, and rulers. Visitors were verbally abused. Children were often left alone with no supervision, which resulted in pregnancies. Eva's license was not renewed, and the home began to dismantle in 1933. The Social Security Act was passed in 1935, and the Aid to Families with Dependent Children program provided money for families to take care of their children at home, rather than place them in institutions. This act, along with professionalization of social work and regulation of child care institutions, caused orphanages to decline even further. In 1940, the home had been closed for seven years. Eva was 71 years old and still listed as superintendent. Her sister, Ollie Price, 66 years old, was listed as an inmate. There were an older and a younger family living there, several inmates, and renters. During the 1940s and 1950s, minority children were removed from their homes at higher rates than white children. This was most likely due to poverty, lack of supportive resources, and social work bias rather than emotional problems, behavioral issues, or dysfunctional families. The Grand Army of the Republic was founded in Springfield, Illinois on April 6, 1866 by Dr. Benjamin Stevenson. It served veterans of the Union Army during the Civil War and its principles were fraternity, charity, and loyalty. It was one of the first racially integrated fraternal organizations and political advocacy groups in the United States. 
They supported voting rights for black veterans, patriotic education, Memorial Day as a national holiday, veterans pensions, and the election of Republican political candidates. They had posts in every state and reached peak enrollment in 1890 with 410,000 members. Eighteen years later, on May 22, 1886, the John A. Brass Post No. 578 of the Grand Army of the Republic was organized in Springfield for African American men. Seventeen years after the Grand Army of the Republic was formed, in 1883, the Women's Relief Corps was formed as a nonprofit auxiliary. Objectives were patriotism, loyalty to the Union, and community service, particularly for veterans and their dependents. Three years later, on November 16, 1886, the John A. Bross Women's Relief Corps No. 58, auxiliary to the John A. Bross Post of the Grand Army of the Republic, was formed in Springfield for African American women. In 1940, the national president of the Women's Relief Corps appointed Eva as national aide. Her duty was to boost membership. Eva eventually became president of the local and state Women's Relief Corps groups. She gave this speech at an Illinois convention in 1941. For 52 years I have worked in the Women's Relief Corps. I am indeed glad to live to see this. When I came into the order, I wondered if I would see the time that I would stand from this platform after having made good over serious obstacles. I wonder how many remember when I served on the executive board with Amanda Brown. That is a long time ago. Several faces are missing. One of them, Flo Miller, but her daughter is here to carry on. When I look at Comrade Lewis, I think of my father who fought during the Civil War and was a good soldier, and we are all friends even though we are black and you are white, and we are glad to go on serving. And when we are called to defend Old Glory, the boys who are black will be there with the boys that are white. I have in the making a new corps in Jacksonville, as I am quite proud that I was made national aide. I wish to thank Mrs. Niederfeld and her daughter, Ethel May, for they came back three times before we got together to organize this new corps in Decatur. I hope to get another corps before we go out of office, and will keep trying. I'm sure I will succeed. This new corps in the name of James H. Lewis will do their duty by him. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs was formed July 26, 1896 in Washington, D.C., with Mary Church Terrell serving as the first president. Their motto was lifting as we climb, as they worked on issues of civil rights, injustice, women's suffrage, lynching, Jim Crow laws, education, children, and the elderly. By 1918, they had 300,000 members. Eva was a member of this organization, and in 1902, at their Illinois State Convention, Eva gave a talk entitled, Our Women, Their Aims and Their Efforts. Six years later, in 1908, Eva was state president of the organization. Crispus Attucks was African and Native American and believed to be the first person killed in the Boston Massacre, which subsequently led to the American Revolution. He became an icon of heroism and community service groups were created in his name. Eva was involved with these groups. Phyllis Wheatley was from West Africa and became an enslaved person in Boston. She was taught how to read and write and then set free after becoming the first African American to publish a book of poems in 1773. Eva became involved in the Phyllis Wheatley Club, which later became associated with the YWCA. Susan Lawrence became Vice President of the Illinois Commission of the National Half-Century Anniversary of Negro Freedom, and Eva became Vice Chairman of the Department of Sociology for the Commission. Mary A. Lawrence Women's Club began July 4, 1915, and with Eva's help, continued to provide for the Lincoln Colored Home. On December 17, 1943, Eva was hit by a car at the intersection of 12th and Jackson Streets, one block from her home in Springfield. She was on her way to visit a neighbor when a car collided with another vehicle, then skidded out of control. 
Eva had a head injury and was taken to St. John's Hospital. She remained an invalid the rest of her life, although her sister, Ollie Price, stayed close. At the age of 80, Eva was taken to Eloise Nursing Home in Quincy, Illinois. She died there two weeks later on January 31, 1950, seven years after the accident. Eva's sister Ollie and daughter Beatrice helped with funeral and burial arrangements in Springfield, Illinois. The Carpenter Funeral Home handled her remains, which were then sent to St. John's African Methodist Episcopal Church for services. Eva was buried in an unmarked grave in a potter's field beside her sister Ollie and along with her father at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois.